It is here. The thing we have dreaded is here. The cloud that has danced off in the distance for so long has crept in during the night, under doors and through cracks. It has seeped into the souls of our children like a venom violating a bloodstream. It is a mirror to our darkest desires, dirt cheap, plentiful, corrosive, cold-blooded, murderous. Yet it seduces with an irresistible siren song that promises warmth and comfort and numbness. It is the demon at the door, and it is everywhere. On the streets, yes, but also in the suburbs and in the homes, the workplace and the schools. It is where you live, it is who you love. You can't look away any longer because it is here. The thing we have dreaded is here. Underneath the darkness, behind the lights, on a Monday night in downtown Seattle, or any night for that matter, there is a sickness, a profound sickness that we have somehow learned to ignore. Well, it's a giant, junky town built around a huge needle. How rampant is it in this city? Mm. It's everywhere, really. It's everywhere. People that you wouldn't even suspect to use, use. This man doesn't want his name used. We'll call him Steve. This is just what I want to do now. It is what you want to do. Yeah, I know this place will never leave me. Drugs and shit, man. I, I can't be happy without drugs. He's 23, has two daughters, and is unapologetically addicted to meth and heroin. Do you steal for your habit? If I, I rob, pillage, rape, plunder. I do it, you know, whatever it takes, man, but I won't steal from my friends or my family. I carry a center punch in my pocket just in case I see a backpack in a car, purse, whatever. Yeah. Like, if I walked by your guys' car and didn't know who you were right now, everything in your car would probably be mine. Or my day would be my dope dealers, technically. And you don't feel bad about that? No, I don't know you. I have no clue who you are. People that you think you can trust. Nick is and different. He, he dressed guilty. up for this interview as best he could. It makes it hard. You ever feel guilty? Or are you beyond that? I feel guilty every day. He's been using for five years now, but he says he hasn't forgotten what it felt like to have a normal life. It seems like everything was hunky-dory, all right. Nothing could go wrong. And then... And it started by falling out of the back of a, a truck, splitting myself open pretty bad. And they gave me a bunch of pills, and I started taking the pills, and from there it progressed to heroin. The two of them and their friend Lexi walk down an alley next to the Paramount. It is well lit. They don't care. And they start cooking heroin. Six up. It's not worth it. Cop just rolled past. I was uh, splitting shots where they were like making one up for me, one up for him. And then this will probably be saved for later because it's not my it's his So. They insert the needle and shoot the heroin into their systems. Addicts call it getting well. Wipe your arm. Safety first, guys. The drug mixes with their blood and seeps into their brains, and the numbness that they live for sweeps over them. Hello, good man. Let me ask you what you what do you feel right now? Well, I kind of feel like I'm high on heroin a lot. Um, it's a real slow, warm rush. It's kind of a it's kind of like a mix of bliss and just I don't know, man. I feel good. Just, Nick, how about you? I feel all right. I feel like um, everything is going to be okay now. <laughs> I feel like it, I pulled the blanket close on a freezing cold night. Like right about now, it feels like nothing could go wrong. I feel like nothing bad can happen to me or anybody.
there was a home in Snoqualmie, and in the home is an upstairs bedroom, a girl's room. There are old drawings on the wall and a t-shirt that says, love is blonde. There are things in the room that any girl might have, sunglasses, pictures, bracelets, a candle. And there is a basket of clothes in the room too. Dirty laundry tossed aside to be washed later. The clothes have been there in that basket, unwashed, for nearly two years. She was vivacious, outgoing, smart, funny, sarcastic. Yeah, she just, uh, she was a bright soul. The lens of regret focuses only backwards in time. Where are you, Amber? Say at the Golden Gate. On one fleeting image, then another, until the mind is filled with a collage of golden hair and giggles and suntans and beautiful, youthful possibility. Hi, Bobby, I love you. I mean, just growing up, we did Girl Scout. I mean, we did everything that every American family does. We did Girl Scouts. We did, you know, I volunteered at her school. I was the troop leader. She played with her friends in the backyard. We had a swimming pool. She did everything that every young kid that is, does in this country. Her name was Amber Roberts. Michael and Kristen split up when she was just two, but they remained close friends. Kristen remarried, Michael did not. They made sure that Amber's childhood was as normal as possible. Boing, 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 boing. And as she got older, they tried to rein in her natural curiosity and strong will without stifling a burgeoning free spirit. She was drinking some and smoking pot. One thing led to another. She tried ecstasy in the eighth grade. She graduated from high school and got a full-time job. In February of 2015, she tried heroin. Nobody's quite sure why. Nobody's quite sure how much she used after that. One of her best friends from kindergarten said, everyone's talking that Amber's doing hardcore drugs. What does that mean exactly? She said, I don't know, possibly heroin. And I said, heroin? On a Tuesday in June, Kristen confronted her. And said, are you doing heroin? And she flat out said no. And I believed her. Yeah. And I told her that if you try that just once, you will die. And she stormed up the stairs and said, I know, Mom, I'll never do that. And that was the only conversation that I had with her about it. In the early morning chill, the gate goes up on another day in the Seattle Police Department street brawl against drugs. We start off patrolling, we take the pulse of, of the city, you know, we see who's out. Three of them ride in a van, Felix Reyes and Chad Winfrey in front, Victor Mays with binoculars in the back. We're trying to get at least a block jump on them. They are a warrant apprehension unit. The SPD working hand in hand with the Department of Corrections, looking for people with outstanding warrants, users and dealers who've broken deals with the feds. That insatiable appetite to get uh, to get high. It's, it's it says American has apple pie. They patrol the troubled underbelly of the Emerald City. I have a head injury. I'm a migraine victim. I have autism. I was born disabled. An alert comes over the radio. Hispanic male, 25 to 30, black and white, from the beach ball camp. Bicycle black cops stopped somebody who was dealing drugs, and he took off. They lost him. He was wearing khaki shorts. You need to offer them a way out. The guys in the van talk about the thing they fight every day. So it, heroin, it grabs you physically first, but it creates so many problems in your life that uh, by the time you think about coming out of it, it, there's so much damage done. And then you add to that the mental health crisis that we are in, right? Those guys are self-medicating too. So now, the, now you have mentally ill people who should be in a place, a safe place, being treated out in the streets, homeless, using drugs, and committing crime. You add that, you got a, you got a metropolitan city. Woohoo! <laughs> and then you give them a tent. Along 3rd Avenue, Felix Reyes has his eyes peeled. Get the cat shot, that's it. 
Alright. You're under arrest. I wanna to talk to you too. Uh, no, 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 I wanna to talk to you too. Hey, could Come you on. tell the bikes, please? Customers at the McDonald's get an iPhone. No, 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 no. So how do you know them? Oh, how do you know them? Oh, okay. Adam? Yeah. Take it back off. You got a DLC warrant. Oh, yeah, oh, man. You're nice try, man. Yeah, Thanks for being good, though. I got some. He's on DLC supervision and has a warrant out for his arrest for absconding. Needles are found. Two guys are cuffed and put into the van. We have a twofer. These officers know that the guy in the khaki shorts will be replaced on the streets selling heroin within a matter of minutes. Back at the precinct, Ali Diaz tested positive for heroin, cocaine, and meth. How long have you been using heroin? Uh, six years. Six years? Because uh, if, I, if I try to kick here in the streets, I find it everywhere. It's everywhere. Everywhere you go, downtown especially. Downtown, you walk through. You walk through downtown, it's, it's, you see it everywhere. It, and anybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. And it's just, there's no way out. Uh, over here, there's no way out. I wish you, I wish you luck, right? And then he was locked up right, to care. face the sickness and pain of heroin withdrawal. Back on the streets, the men in the van got back to the job of pushing against a boulder that never seems to move. Does it ever feel like you guys are out just in sheer numbers? Yes, and we're never going to win the war on drugs, that's for sure. Up the road a ways, on a chilly night in a dirt cheap motel along Aurora Avenue, a handful of junkies lean against one another for comfort, and they speak from the gut. We're going to eject somewhere. Either it's going to be in your bathroom, or it's going to be in a place the state pays for. Now, what do you want to clean up? Do you want to let the nurses deal with it, or do you, you want to let your night shift, night manager deal with it? Because we're going to get high downtown. We're going to use, period. You know, it's, it's sick. But it's, it is what it is, I guess, you know. Josh came here from Boston as a fisherman. He hurt his hand, and in the hospital, they put him on pain meds, and when the meds ran out, well, you know the story. It was when I looked at the pill bottles with no more refills. And that evening, um, I was being shown how to put a needle in my arm. The sink in the room is cluttered. There is a candle burning. Josh has the words, hold fast, tattooed on his knuckles. Like most of my family, they don't know what I do or what I'm up to or where I'm at. I'm just kind of gone. His friend Ace is 30 years old. Ace works construction occasionally and has two kids somewhere. Yeah, well, since I started using, like, I think about it before, I used to vacation. I used to, like, do stuff with people. And now it's just all I do is try to try to get heroin or use heroin. Like, uh, I used to create memories, and now I just have addiction, really. That's just so sad to hear you say that, Ace. I mean, it is really sad. I think about it a lot, and, like, really, like, I want, I want my life back, like I do. Like, you know, I want, you know, I want to have all the things that I used to have that I threw away for addiction. Richie is from Alaska. Sometimes he uses six or seven times a day. Depends on how much money he has. He has an ex-wife and two children. Does it feel better than love? Heroin? Like, does it feel better than family? It, and yet we're willing to... It doesn't compare at all. You know, the feeling of, of heroin is, is wonderful. Don't get me wrong. You know, it, it's like nothing in this world. But everybody and anybody that knows the feeling of love and, and the warmth of the family just knows that there, there's no comparing to that. Have you, have, has heroin taken that from you? Everything. Everything in my life I've, I've lost. At some point while Richie was talking, Ace fell asleep. And from the outside, if you didn't know better, you'd think it was kids on a road trip looking for adventure.
In June, two days after the strained conversation she had with her mother about heroin, Amber Roberts, who had a job and lots of friends, went to an electronic dance music festival in Las Vegas. She came home on a Wednesday and turned around on Saturday and went to the Paradiso Festival at the Gorge. On Sunday, June 28, 2015, five months after trying heroin for the first time, she came home early. And she looked fine, she looked normal. I gave her a big hug and I thank God every day that I gave her a big hug and told her that I love her because it's what you do as a parent. No. I haven't heard from her for a few hours, weird. So I text Krista, I'm like, hey, is Amber up yet? You know, like It was like three. Three. Yep. And uh, um, I just thought she was sleeping. Yeah, you know. I just decided to go upstairs and um, I opened the door. She kind of was in the bed in a position, she's kind of half on, she's face down, half on, half off. And I thought, so I thought, that's a funny way to sleep on the bed. And then I went up and I, and I touched her and I said, Amber? And then I just started screaming for my husband who was outside. And I just, when you bring a child into this world and then you see the end in front of you, there's a moment where you just don't understand. And then the next thing I know is my managers at Costco is coming out to tell me I have a phone call. And it was her husband, uh, who I could barely understand, yeah. just saying that she's gone. There is a shrine now in Kristen's living room, and when the dull ache of loss threatens to swallow her whole, she tends to it like a garden. So just things, just things, to constantly remind me of her. On a good day, the pictures smiling out at her take her back to before, and for fleeting moments, she can almost forget that heroin took it all away from her. You just don't want to be here anymore. You know, I've come, clo I've come close to wanting to end it. Amber was Michael's only child, and he has found only one comfort in her absence, trying to bring awareness, trying to wake people up to the menace that took his child away. I will tell her story until I die or see her if it helps or saves anyone else. Nothing changes now in Amber's room. The old drawings on the wall, the t-shirt that says love is blonde, the basket of clothes that will never be laundered. Nothing changes. And yet for two people and their families and everyone who ever knew or cared about one bright, beautiful young woman with her whole life ahead of her, everything has changed. One corner on one block in one city. Third and Pine in downtown Seattle. Addicts call Third Avenue the Blade. That means you can always find someone to sell you stuff there 24-7. If you stop and watch, you will see an entire illegal economy playing out before your eyes. Bicycle cops ride by all day long, but when they're gone, it is a seller's market. There's a big man that makes the rounds. Another guy comes up to the big man. The big man hands him something. He hustles away at a run. Down the street he goes. The big man is talking to a guy with a backpack. A third guy walks up, gives the guy with the backpack some cash. He takes it and gives part of it to the big man. Then he starts digging around in his pockets. The third guy waits. They're talking about something. And then finally the guy with the backpack moves out, looks up and down the street quickly, moves back in, hands the third guy something small, and just like that, a deal is struck. The guy with the backpack hands something to a guy in a red shirt. The guy in the red shirt looks at it, thinks about it, looks at it again, fishes around in his pocket, looks around, and then hands a wad of cash to the guy with the backpack. It's a done deal. And here comes a girl with a hood she approaches the guy with the backpack. He looks at something in his pocket. They stand there for a minute, the three of them. This is right on the corner in broad daylight. He looks around, reaches into another pocket, then hands something to the girl. She looks at it. He waits. She gives him some cash. 
done deal. And moments later, as she walks away, she looks like she could be 15 years old. One corner on one block in one city, Third and Pine in downtown Seattle. Long before Lexi walked into the alley with her friends, we met with her downtown more than a year ago. Hi. She ran into a friend that night named Darnell. Hey. You heard about text, right? Te no. Texas is gay. Text, 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 little. <sighs> How'd that happen? Overdose. That sucks really bad because I just saw him the other day, probably the same day. No shock. Um, kind of numb to my friends dying now. Every time I get on Facebook, it's another one gone. Kind of stopped crying after a while. A year later, she was in that motel room on Aurora talking to us, and I brought up that night on the streets. It's funny you bring that up, actually. Um, that was my friend, and um, <clears throat> he actually goes, he went by Detox. That was it, how everybody knew him. And Detox has um, since passed away since then. He was. Um, he was found under a bridge. He had been dead for three days. That same night, Lexi's friend Richie talked about family and the things that haunt his troubled soul. The last few times I called my dad, one of the things that he said each time, it, it absolutely killed me inside. You know, and, and it, I cried after when I got off the phone. Um, you know, he said that I'm fearing that call, you know, that, that it happened, you know. A call that, that you're dead. Yeah. One week after that conversation, Richie, like Tex and Darnell, was dead. Two months later, after she watched her friend Steve and Nick shoot up in the alley, Lexi told me about Richie's fate. I actually was um, unaware until just last night that uh, my buddy Richie, who was in the hotel room with me last time, uh, ha was found in his tent. He had been there at least a day or two and was had overdosed. Um, Lexi is currently like on and off an opiate blocker called Suboxone, which some say is a junkie's hair. best chance at getting clean. She is homeless and death is all around her. And like so many, her struggle to stay alive and get clean is an ongoing battle that doesn't seem to ever end. At the center of Seattle's heroin epidemic, two men are locked in a philosophical knockdown dragout. Dr. Caleb Bantagreen studies addiction at the University of Washington. He preaches compassion and patience. He says we can treat our way out of this thing if it's done correctly. We're talking about human beings who are hardwired to respond to these drugs. Senator Mark Melosha sees a city on the verge of ruin, sees lives being wasted in filth and chaos, and asks, where is our government? Where is our law? If we wait for every heroin user to become enlightened, um, most of them are going to die. Both men agree on one thing. Treatment is the answer. But Dr. Green says the addicts have to decide for themselves when it's time. <sighs> so we, we need to prevent the problem from starting, and we always need to keep doing We need to treat people who have opiate use disorder, and we also need to make sure that people who are continuing to use and are not yet ready for treatment, that they also get to live, that they continue to have access to services to keep them alive. Senator Melosha, to say the least. We have to intervene. Sees it differently. And we need that early intervention. We need to arrest people when we catch them early in the cycle where we actually get them off fairly easy. But when we wait six months or a year because we don't want to blame, we don't say anything negative about you taking heroin, then we're doomed. We're killing our sons and daughters, um, brothers and sisters. You have to have leadership. And if that leadership is because people are injecting in public and that's upsetting a broader array of constituents, fine. As long as we actually really fundamentally deal with this issue in a humane and evidence-based way. Are you proposing that we get some sort of a treatment program where you 
you can't exit, you have to stay in stay Exactly, and monitor. They're the effect, the most effective treatment is you have to build relationships, to build those community ties, the family, but you need to work long term. If you just allow somebody to leave and go back on the street to their own environment, they're gonna go back to continue to break the law, uh, uh, commit crimes, take drugs until they die. And people use drugs, they have for thousands of years, they use them all across our city, and we need to build services and capacity for them where they are. The data shows it's when we stop the arresting people, stop the arresting drug dealers or users or people hooked on heroin, that's when it exploded. Our toleration for people taking drugs. The debate rages and not much changes. Meanwhile, people are dying slow, lonely deaths, and so is a once beautiful city. She calls herself a traveling vagabond minstrel. Her name is Paige Conka. She's also a heroin addict, at times a homeless prostitute, and a lost soul. We took her to retrieve her banjo from a former boyfriend. She keeps it with him so it doesn't get stolen. Her father and grandfather were musicians. Her dad went to prison when she was a kid. Her mother was an alcoholic. You know, I ended up definitely with, with that gene, and at least I got music, the, <laughs> at least I got the good musical genes, but, but uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, I've got the, uh, the alcoholic gene as well. We followed Paige when she went to buy some black tar heroin. She went tromping down Dearborn Avenue, and 15 minutes later, here she came, now riding a bicycle, with a guy right behind her prancing on a hobby horse and stomping in mud puddles. Ten minutes later, under an overpass in South Seattle, she showed us her prize, a tiny bag of slow death. She took off walking, and then about 75 yards away from traffic on Airport Way, she squatted down and cheerfully went to work. It smells like um, Italian food. You must have known that heroin was not the path to go down, right? You'd you figure, you know, that's why I, I think back, it's either I was stupid or I don't even know what. Paige played the banjo a little bit for us. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, that, that is my saving grace. I think that that is the only only reason that I'm still even on this planet. I'm trying to think. But on this day, she wasn't playing well. Yeah, I just, <laughs> that's the problem. My, my memory's so bad. <laughs> and it upset her. It really makes it difficult. My, my boyfriend uh, killed himself, and then I found my father, you know, passed away in the bathtub, you know, both drug-related, and so that was really traumatic, and that's when I really said, okay, game on, you know, it's time to really do, you know, become a full-fledged heroin addict, I guess, and just sleep the rest of my life away. Under the overpass, Paige put the black tar into a spoon, then added some water. She cooked the combination with a lighter, then sucked the stuff into a syringe. Well, at least I didn't spill it. That would have been the next disaster. She tied off her arm with her purse. And as she got closer to injecting, there was an urgency about her. She hit an artery, which she said is a bad thing. So she pulled up her skirt and injected the heroin into the femoral artery in her thigh, which she says is a good thing. How do you, how do you feel right now? Does your mind get foggy or not at all? You just feel normal. Like, I don't sense a huge change in you. Yeah, basically it just kind of, you know, just sort of relaxed me a little bit and, uh, yeah, it just kind of made me normal. I hate to say it that way. It's, you know, seems so crazy when you say it, or, you know, when you think about it. But unfortunately, it's, you know, yeah, it's like I need, you know, the stuff to just be regular, kind of, if that makes any sense. Paige is careful not to leave a mess. She says not all junkies are slobs. And she says she doesn't steal. She'll sell her body before she does that. It was uh, the least of all evils. At least I felt like I was just hurting myself, if anything. At least it was mine to, to sell, do what I will with. Is, is that still a part of your life at all? Uh, I've, I mean, I've, to be honest, I've done it a, 
you know, a handful of times in the last two years, just out of sheer desperation. As she went back to her tent under the off-ramp, I remember asking what will become of her, what happens now? She said, oh boy, that's a good question. And I noticed something as she sat there strumming her banjo. After shooting up, her playing improved. Snohomish County has been hit especially hard. There's a lot going on, and I would say it's an epidemic. It's, it's spreading. To fight it every day, Everett police officers and trained social workers team up. Do you want to just go straight to the pit? OK. They venture into the darkness and sickness that can be found in the corners and crevices of Everett. This program we're doing now is different because we've tried booking on all these small misdemeanor charges and we're doing nothing but creating that same cycle and that same issue. The pit, as it's called, is where junkies come to shoot up and sometimes sleep. Lots of, uh, watch your step, there's lots of needles and... Uh, and feces sometimes. And human waste. <laughs> it is a grotesque cavity under an overpass, filthy and disgusting, and on this day, empty. For the most part, usually this spot now is used, they use, um, to use drugs. And they're back on the road again this time to some riverfront property that's been converted into a purgatory of misery and anguish. Mm -hmm. There's a puddle of urine and a panda bear that's seen better days. There's a ramshackle tent with a foot sticking out, and the co team checks in. Are you using? A little bit. Yeah? yeah Stacy McColl talks about chances and programs. So if you were interested, we could come down here in the morning and pick you up and take you up to Compass. One of the guys inside wants to talk about God. I'm trying to, I'm trying to turn my life over back to the Lord yeah. and walk with God, you know, in, in, in humbleness. I forgot your first name. They make an appointment for tomorrow that may or may not be Here. kept. Jared and Rob. Rob. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. And they're off again. So this is another camp that we have out here along the, the river. So it looks like a vast nothingness. They march us down into a labyrinth of bramble and bushes and tangled tunnels through muck and mud, and a quarter of a mile in, telltale garbage, and then a camp. Hello, it's Ever, please. We're out here with the social workers. Hello. Anyone in there? Eventually, a guy named John comes out. Um, no, I do not do heroin. Yeah. Been able to stay away from that stuff. Yes, sir. Stacy and Caitlin talked John into going and getting an ID the next day. Hey, John, could we come pick you up tomorrow? I'll be here. Okay, tomorrow, maybe like 10 30, 11. Yeah, I've been doing this job long enough that I realize that we can't arrest our way out of it. That a lot of the people that we do come in contact with have been arrested numerous times, but they haven't changed their behavior. And then next to the mission in downtown Everett, there's a man on his back. She unzips his jacket, gets the crowd to back off. Officer Kevin Davis shows up. There you go. Hello. Hey. Wake up. 3611, we administered an art camp. 30 seconds later, he's up. Doing all right? Everett Police here. We're here to help you. You know where you are? What's your name? It's okay, we're here. We're here to help you. We're trying to help you out. Yeah, we're here to help you, okay? You're not you're not in trouble. No, it's all good. His name is Tito. 
He's just a kid, full of either heroin or booze, or most likely both. And then once we administered Narcan, it was like 20 seconds later, 30 seconds later, he just sat up. Tito was off to the hospital, and the COET team was back on the streets, back into the darkness and sickness, back to the dirty job of offering salvation to the numb and the lost. These are uh, notes that I had written to my family and to my boyfriend when I was just hoping that, just this last relapse when I was hoping that I wouldn't wake up so that they would, they would just what I wanted to say to them. A couple of notes scribbled on folded pieces of paper written by a sick 32-year-old woman with a shattered ego and a crumpled soul and a desire to slip off into a slumber and never wake up again. Sometimes Megan Hammond says things that make you want to cry. Things like this. I wouldn't, I would never say that I hate anybody. Like, I can't think of one person who I could say that I hate, you know, except for myself. It's a strong word. She grew up in a nice neighborhood in Sammamish. She says she had a great childhood, great parents. She played soccer and violin and liked to be the center of attention. She was precocious. People would um, describe her as being very precocious. She was an extrovert, very social, and very smart, bright. Megan's mother, Sandy, and her stepfather, Alex, own a small winery in Woodenville. Looking back, they remember when their daughter started to stray. It's Part of uh, it was just, this is the age, and yeah, you know. We'll try and, something out. And yeah, yeah. I mean, we were concerned, but also thinking it was part of just a growth thing. Growth thing yeah. Yeah. Megan was in the running start program at Skyline High School. She got a job as a hostess at Kachina Kachina. There was a guy that came in and sold meth to the bartender, and um, so he ended up you know, asking me, what drugs have you done? And I just thought he was so cool. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, smoke some weed, coke. I totally lied, I'd never done coke or anything like that. And he was like, you wanna do something 10 times better than coke? I was like, okay. And he uh, gave me some meth and it was all over from there. She lost weight, she felt good. The trap was set. Yeah, and I was like, why doesn't everybody do this? This is great. You liked it? Yeah. Three months later, she realized she didn't just want meth, she needed it. Well, I mean, I got expelled from high school and I was stealing from people. I'd go into the locker room when people were in gym and I'd steal their wallets and stuff. It was, I went from being in, like homecoming princess, varsity golf, premier soccer, to like the town crackhead in a matter of three years. <laughs> it was pretty bad. At some point, while visiting a drug dealer, she saw a man smoking something, something she hadn't seen before. And I asked him, you know, is that hash? I thought it was hash, this sticky brown stuff. And he was like, no, it's black tar. And my eyes must have gone, whoosh, you know, and we got some. And the guy that I was with started shooting it right away, and I smoked it. And he was like, you don't ever want to shoot it. Don't do this. Don't do what I do. So I watched him shooting it for two weeks. And then after a couple weeks, I was like, OK. Hit me, you know, I want to try it. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the best way that I can describe it is you feel like like a warm blanket of, like, everything's OK. Just go over you. So it doesn't matter what worries or concerns or anxiety you have. Just It just goes away completely, and everything's OK. And did you believe that? Well, the drug tells you so, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty strong. Still, Megan went to college at Western, but by then her parents knew about her heroin use. It was, you know, are you, are you using? No, I'm not, I'm fine. And then wanting, wanting so desperately to believe that, right. that then I don't take it on. 
In 2006, when Megan's little sister was just 10 years old, her parents realized they couldn't have a heroin addict living in the house. She was home for the summer, and I found out that she was using again. And she, after she had said she didn't, I said, I mean, this was the hardest day of my whole entire life was, um, you've got 30 minutes to pack. And she put some stuff into a little bag, and it was July 11th, and I drove her to the U District, and I gave her $100, and I said goodbye. On East Hastings Street in Vancouver, British Columbia, there is a place called Insight. There are booths inside, a dozen or so. It is the first legal supervised drug injection site in North America. Ed Murray would like Seattle to become the second. Como's Matt Markovich and photographer Eric Jensen visited Insight. They met people like Bowden, who comes here two, three, four times a day. There are syringes, alcohol wipes, tourniquets, and candles set up like a condiment stand at a fast food restaurant. Got my little tin paper of heroin right here. They cook the drugs there in the booths with no worries about dirty needles or overdoses. Neil Areo is the manager. So while someone's injecting, if there's uh, any issues that they might be having, trying to find uh, a vein or injecting safer, um, nurses and healthcare workers are on hand to provide that. Bowden uses the place but doesn't necessarily agree with the place. Um, I think it kind of enables more the using of drugs because since all these supplies are free, what's going to stop me from um, grabbing them and using more drugs? Sean Reed is a dealer right outside of InSight. It's like he's selling hot dogs at a ball game. Side, down, base powder, old school. As sellers, junkies are going to come here. Why not stand in front right where they are? They're going to come here to inject the drugs, so why not be here to sell to them? He also goes inside periodically. Methamphetamine is his drug of choice. Here we go. Whew. How you doing? Whoa, that's a bitter. Whew. How many times do you come in here now? Hey? How many times a day? Yeah. Uh, Huh. At least three. Whoa. They're usually not that big. Nah. Huh. Ooh, that's good shit. I'm just confused about um, who and how we ch choose to judge. Dr. Caleb Banta Green is in favor of Seattle getting a safe injection site. If you ask somebody whose brother died of an overdose, would you rather have your brother dead or using a safe consumption facility or being on a treatment medication, they're going to say alive. Seattle police officers are reluctant to discuss political issues, and the free injection site concept is a political issue. But Officer Chad Winfrey did say this. The drug dealing and the potential for violence in the, the three, four block radius around that place is going to be, it'd be a nightmare. Ginny Burton is a former heroin addict. She's been clean for four and a half years. She now counsels addicts at a downtown shelter. I think... Uh setting up safe places for people to use in. I think that we're helping people kill themselves, even more so than they are already. Had I have been supported in finding places to legally destroy myself, because that's what it is, um, I most likely would have ended up dying instead of getting help. Eric Seitz is also a former addict. He spent time in Vancouver at Insight. He says, it kept him alive. It's like they're going to use anyways, and like you might as well keep them inside um, and out of the alleyways, you know, shooting up with puddle water, you know, getting infections that are costing people even more money in the long run. Senator Mark Malosha visited Vancouver. He also went to see Insight. It was a, a sight of humanity that literally um, uh, made me speechless. I was horrified. And is this the best government can do to allow this to happen? Outside, the day our reporters were there, a man sitting on the street prepared to shoot up. Can I help you? Thank you. Hey, buddy, come on. Whoa, thank you. Hey, 
Moments later, he was convulsing, lurching, quivering. His systems were shutting down. He was overdosing, dying on the street. Almost immediately, there were nurses from Insight at his side. They administered an anti-overdose medication. The people at Insight say this happens four, maybe five times a day. He would live to shoot up again. And the question persists, a question that Seattle wrestles with. Is he alive because of his proximity to a safe injection site, or will he eventually die because the safe injection site made it easy to continue being an addict. How you doing? Good. Good. Hey guys. Are you selling smokes? The streets many of us avoid. The gritty, drug-infested streets of Seattle are where Randy Jokola and Jason Drummond spend their days. You can find them here, riding amongst the very thing they are trying to stop. Hey, don't put no camera in my face unless I ask you to. They've been on these streets for years. I was the most devoted police officer in downtown Seattle. And I didn't even have to pay him for that either. Look at that. <laughs> well, thanks, man. <laughs> They know all the players and what they're after. Please, please make your appointment so you get down there. Don't sabotage it, okay? Just numb. Yeah. yeah. They numb out to the world and they don't feel their pain. And that's all they need. That's what they want. Randy and Jason's relationship with heroin addicts is part parent, part friend, part law. When I see you dealing with Jimmy, you know what it looks like, right? Okay, come on, don't get yourself in trouble, William. Hey, I, for I forgot your name. What was it again? Cliff. How's that working out? Did you get that place yet? Um, yeah, yeah, I did. I got they introduced us to some of what they call their frequent flyers. Kevin, who is clean now. He's horrible. He's, he's, he's horrible. Devin, you, uh, who is not. Do you take to get higher just to just to you get by? You escape bomb? reality, man. <laughs> you escape reality. You started off just a guy, and. Uh, and it turned into, so I don't have to think about the reality of what's going on in my life. The outcome's really, I'm either going to get out of here and make sense of myself, or I'm going to die in an alley with a needle stick down my arm. It's a sad story, man. Randy and Jason have tried to get Devin into programs. He never shows up. They make the rounds, and it seems like the two of them know everybody. So how you been, Wesley? I haven't seen you in a long time. A man from California looking at colleges with his daughter had his car broken into. His daughter's laptop was stolen. It's not uncommon. That sucks. Yeah. And they're stealing. Left and right. Oh, so much. You, I, I guess it would be, I would love to hear what the total is of oh, if all the main, the business in the downtown car would put their loss of theft. Millions and millions of dollars. A year, just kind of, if they could compile that stat, we would all just probably drop dead if we heard what the total was. All right. <laughs> the recipe on the streets is simple. They try to help users, they bust dealers. They're the predators. They're the ones making the tax-free money, being um, treating people like crap out there and getting away with it. Not long ago, they busted a dealer on the corner selling drugs. He had meth on him and a pistol that had been stolen in a burglary. They processed him, and to their amazement, he was back on the same corner the very next day. The will of the street cop, you see, does not always match the will of the city. It's a frustration, but 
not as much as you might think because it's out of my hands. All I can do is do my job, my part of it, well. Meanwhile, the guys in the big blue van continue their patrol. Burton, Christopher Burton, on the right. He's, he's backing up, he's taking off. Christopher, don't run. Don't run. Taking off. Christopher. He wants to talk to you, bro. Don't walk away. He wants to talk to you. DLC. <sighs> Thank you, Christopher, for spilling your coffee all over me. No, you're tripping. What do you guys think is there? There's nothing there. No, we gotta take the backpack off, man. Stay still. I know that you're high. You just gotta get control, get control. Christopher Burton uh, is uh, on probation with the Department of Corrections. Um, and what our job is is to stop and contact him, as you can see. By the way he acted, he saw us and wanted to take off really quick. Would not stop on our command. Um, DOC interviewed him, determined that he'd be under arrest. The guys on the bikes and the guys in the van meet up in a brand new parking garage. Hardly anybody parks there because addicts have made it their own. There's some needles everywhere and, and stuff left over from people's cars all the way up and all the way down. Go in the parking lot, car prowl, maybe shoot up, and then exit out the sidewalk. Easy. Dude, they have the run of the building. They have the run of the whole building. Later on, on 3rd Avenue, Devin sees us again and looks like he might have something to say. And then he just keeps on walking. For years, ever since her mother dropped her off in the U District, Megan Hammond has waged a valiant and dirty fight against heroin. She was even clean for four years, from the age of 25 to 29. She had a boyfriend. She went back to school and got her master's at the UW. She had a job she loved. Megan calls them the best years of her life. But eventually, she slipped up just once. It only took once. Oh, it tells me all kinds of things, like, oh, you'll never get it anyways. Or, you're, you're such a screw up, you know. Or, why, why build things up? in your life because you're just going to throw it away anyways. So why even try? Who, who tells you that? My mind. My addict. It's almost like you, you seem to treat it as a separate entity. Well, there's like the good Megan and the bad Megan. <laughs> so, and, and right now they're fighting with each other. They've been fighting each other for 17 years. She's been to rehab no, seven angry. times. Angry. I'm just mad at myself. I'm mad at myself all the time. I can't tell you. It's all the time. I'm mad at myself. Megan Sorry. finds boyfriends no. that steal, and then she pawns no. the goods. Yeah, no Her parents help with rents. Yeah. What else can they do? When's the last time you used? Yesterday. And when do you think you'll use again? Oh, gosh. I don't know. Today. <laughs> Today? I don't know. I hate saying that, but I mean, I'm, I'm hoping on Friday I'll be able to get on Suboxone and uh, I hate saying that. I wish I could just say, oh, well, never. <laughs> it's dumb. It ruins my life. In spite of it all, there is a sweetness about Megan, an innocence almost. She laughs easily. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to do with my face. <laughs> it's okay. Behind it, though, is a darkness, a profound sadness. Have you ever thought bad things about taking your life or...? Yeah, I, I, a couple weeks ago, I, I mean, I, I tried to do too much. And, like, I had notes, you know, for people on me, you know, so if they found me, that they'd have notes. But I just woke up like four hours later under the Spokane Street Bridge and I was like, oh, it didn't work, so. This is where she woke up, alone and tired and ashamed, broken. Which brings us back to the notes she'd pinned inside her jacket. She says she's not sure why she kept them. Mom, Dad, Abby, this is the first letter I've actually written for this purpose. But it seems surreal. I know I blew my last chance. I just can't do it. I just can't. I don't want 
to hurt you guys anymore. I love you three more than life itself, and I hate, hate, hate hurting you over and over and over again. I know things will be better with me gone. I want you all to know that I just went to sleep. That's all. I went to be with those who have gone before me, and I'm done here. I'm not meant for this world. I guess living life in constant fear of failure and in utter despair is no way to live. I have had an amazing 32 years. I'm good going like this. I just went to sleep. And so the nasty little fight raging inside the skin of Megan Hammond continues for yet another day. The terms are stark and crude. It is a battle to the death. (laughs) And so the sickness spreads like a venom violating a bloodstream. And the police push against the boulder, the dealers deal and the buyers buy, and the social services fight the good fight, and the experts study and the politicians make policy, and the parents pray. And the addicts suffer, and the homeless suffer, and the victims of crime suffer, the city and its quality of life suffers. And the more things change, the more they stay the same, and nobody seems to know what to do about the demon at the door. (laughs) 